Mr. Chairman, we should be live streaming. Okay, thanks, Mary Beth. Uh, welcome everybody to the first meeting of the Senate Minerals Business and Economic Development Committee. Um, I'll call this meeting to order at, looks like right at uh, 1.30. Um, Rihanna, will you please call the roll? Yeah, good afternoon, members of the committee. If you could please turn your cameras on for roll call, we'll go ahead and call roll. Rihanna, we can't. This is Chris. That's the reason why we haven't. Okay, thank you for that. Mary Beth, would you please allow them to turn their own cameras on? It's under the participants. I was assuming that Senator Biteman was just uh, going to steal the show and that, <laughs> that was all planned, but. Well, Senator Raffas, I think we've enabled that, so we should be good to go there. We're perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, members, Senator Cooper? Present. Senator Raffas? Here. Senator Wasserberger? Here. Senator Anderson? Absent. And Chairman Beitman? Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thanks, Brianna. Um, and as you know, I am Senator Bo Beitman and I am acting chairman in the absence of our great leader, Senator Anderson, who is on the mend right now. And if he's out there watching, we wish him all the best and a speedy recovery, Senator Anderson. And I'd like to introduce our new member, Senator Ed Cooper. Welcome to the Minerals Committee. Thank you, Chairman. Good to have you on. And uh, we look forward to working with you this for the next two years. Um, also, I'd like to introduce our LSO staff at the moment. If uh, Rihanna and Mary Beth could take a minute to introduce themselves to the committee. Yeah, good morning or good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Rihanna Davidson, and I'll be acting as your committee secretary. And as you guys know, um, this is a new role for all of us. So we just ask for your patience as we run the meeting with you this afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Beth Oatesfall. I'm uh, running the technical side of this. So good luck. Thank you, ladies. Um, before we get started, there's a few uh, announcements I'll make. Uh, we have four hours allotted to us for this, uh, for today's work. We're going to do five bills today. They should be fairly straightforward. I tried to pick the easiest ones so we could get through them quickly. And um, I would remind our participants to please mute until you're ready to speak. Um, if you wish to speak, please raise your hand and then we'll call on you. Um, for, for oral votes, please ensure your video is on and physically raise your hand so we can count your vote. And um, during a break, please turn your cameras off. Those are our housekeeping items. Uh, for the public out there, the meeting is being, being live streamed out on the YouTube channel. Um, there's a link on the home page if you wish to testify. You can click on that link and Mary Beth will get you into the meeting and we can call on you in the order that uh, we receive you. So uh, any other questions from the committee before we dive in? Doesn't look like it at the moment. So our order of business today will be Senate file 44 solid waste cease and transfer program funding first then we'll move on to senate file 41 tax lien enforcement amendments followed by senate file 43 uh, energy authority amendments senate file 61 amortization of sales and use tax and we'll close it out with senate file 42 out-of-state bank charter conversions so with that we will move on to senate file 44 let me see if we have anybody that wants to walk us through this bill here. Uh, looks like we have Director Parfit. Um, can we let him into the discussion? There he is. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, my plan was to, uh, and I'm Todd Parfit, Director of the Department of Environmental Quality. My plan was to turn it quickly over to Luke Esch, our Deputy Director and Solid Waste Administrator, 
uh, as he is the one that's primarily involved with the uh, cease and transfer bill, if you don't mind. I don't mind at all. Thank you, Mr. Director. Okay. Mr. Esch. Here he comes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Senator Cooper, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, once again, my name is Luke Esch. I am the uh, Deputy Director and the Administrator of the Solid and Hazardous Waste Division. And I'll be walking you through the Senate File 44 today, the update to the cease and transfer priority list. So as a bit of background, in 2013, in recognition of the rising costs associated with managing uh, solid waste by our communities around the state, the legislature created the cease and transfer program where in conjunction with the Office of State Lands and Investments, DEQ would work with uh, solid waste operators around the state to provide up to 75% of the costs associated with uh, construction of transfer station as well as the clothing, closing of their small unlined landfills. Um, so in December of 2013, we prepared a list of projects that had, had uh, reached out to DEQ and requested to be placed on the list um, to be prioritized uh, in order to be, receive funding under the program. Um, the department's been working diligently through this list and working with communities to provide funding for their projects and make sure that the uh, projects are uh, well suited for their communities. Um, each year, the department provides an update. So this is this year's update. Um, and each update, we include um, more recent engineering estimates for the, the estimated project costs, as well as reacting to what, what are the emerging needs of the communities around there. Um, you may have heard some discussion about dead animals recently. Um, as you may recall, in 2020, the DEQ worked with this, this uh, uh, committee to revise the priority list to include a $100,000 earmark for, to help communities address dead animal, dead animal management. And so uh, we continue to tr try to listen to our operators to see how we can better uh, work with them to, suit, to meet their needs. And uh, so in October of 2020, we updated the list again <clears throat> and uh, presented it to this committee. And so this is really that uh, the the report that we submitted in October put into up to bill form. Um, the changes that we had from last year include the removal of two projects who received funding under the program already, so they would come off the list. Uh, we had one operator request to be added to the list, that's Lingle, um, as well as we, we had some increased project estimate costs uh, based on some engineering estimates we received from the Bighorn County, Bighorn County Solid Waste Disposal District for both their transfer station as well as their closure. Um, <clears throat> so under the program, we the, the list as it is now, we have 19 facilities remaining on the list, uh, seven transfer stations and 12 closures. The transfer stations, the total cost for the transfer stations is estimated to be about $8.1 million. And the 12 cl closures are an estimate of about $19.7 million. Uh, we have remaining in the, in the account um, approximately $17.8 million with $11.2 million in grants and $6.6 .6 million in loans. Um, and with that as a little bit of background, we can walk through the bill. Beginning on page three, line seven, this is section one. Um, this provides the priority list with the updated facilities. Um, and for a little bit of background, T uh, in the bill stands for transfer station, and the C associated with the project means the closure of that facility. <clears throat> Section two is uh, page six, line two, and that just repeals the priority, the prior program priority list. Um, Section three is page six, line five, and that basically states that the priority list is effective immediately upon becoming law. Um, and with that, I would stand for questions from the committee. Any, any questions? I'm not seeing any. Um, would anybody from the, well, thank you, Mr. Esch, for your testimony. Uh, would anybody from the public wish to testify on this bill? Do we have anybody, Mary Beth? Mr. Chairman, we do. I will admit Jeremiah Raymond right now.
Mr. Ryman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Jeremiah Riemann here on behalf of Wyoming's County Commissioners. I want to thank you for uh, taking up uh, this bill. I know it's part of your normal business, uh, but this is one that certainly becomes of interest for my members. Uh, first off, uh, we have participated with DEQ and the Game and Fish Department, the Department of Agriculture, uh, YDOT, and, and other agencies uh, to try and, and solve some of the issues that exist with chronic wasting disease, animal disposal in particular. Uh, and as part of that working group, one of the solutions that we uh, identified uh, along with others like yourselves uh, was this uh, carcass uh, management uh, project. And so uh, we certainly uh, would request that that continue to move forward. Uh, it is an important issue across the state from uh, almost every county, uh, but uh, it is becoming more critical for uh, counties like Lincoln County, Teton, Fremont, and, and others that have uh, disposal uh, issues. Um, we also uh, stand in support of the various county uh, transfer and closure programs uh, or funding that's included here. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I would stand in uh, for any questions. Thank you. Any questions, committee? No questions. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. Any more public testimony? Mary Beth, do we have anybody else? Mr. Chairman, I do not see anyone else with their hand raised. Okay. Well, I guess we'll close public comment. Uh, committee, what's your pleasure? Uh, Senator Rothfuss. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'll move the bill. Okay. Moved by Rothfuss. Seconded by Wasserberger. Are there any amendments to the bill? I'm not seeing any. Any discussion on the bill? No discussion on the bill. This is a pretty straightforward bill. I guess we'll go ahead and call the roll. Mrs. Davidson, if, if you would like to do that. All right, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we are voting for um, voting on Senate File 44. Senator Cooper? Aye. Senator Rothfuss? Aye. Senator Wasserberger? Aye. Senator Anderson? Absent. Chairman Beitman? Aye. Mr. Chairman, Senate File 44 has passed the Senate Standing Minerals Committee. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Cooper, would you like to uh, manage that bill for us on the floor? Uh, yes, sir. Acting Chairman Byman, I'd be pleased to do that. Thank you. All right. I appreciate you being voluntold. All right. We're on to the next one. Uh, Senate File 41, Tax Lien Enforcement Amendments. Who would like to walk us through that bill? Do we have any volunteers? Uh, Senator Rothfuss. Oh, you're on mute, sir. Thought I clicked it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you'll recall this legislation is an amendment to our prior work on tax lien enforcement and how to appropriately carry it out, uh, recognizing the lien priority changes that we put into effect uh, a couple of years ago or last legislative session and a, a desire to change uh, some of the nuances on how those would be carried through uh, by deleting some language. As you see, uh, we're going into some of the newly changed language on page three in the Romanet 5, where we're striking this language, and I think we strike identical language a little bit later, we'll double check. Any new owner or new person extracting the mineral shall not be subject to a prior lien. Under this paragraph, if the new owner or new person extracting the mineral furnishes evidence of a certification from the application, taxing authorities, et cetera, the concept there being uh, under current statute, we precluded any prior liens, uh, just at a date certain where all of those would be extinguished. And on further consideration during the interim, uh, I think it, it became our desire, and we'll hear in public testimony, 
uh, to let those existing liens expire without terminating them legislatively. So the policy of lien priority will still be in place after this, where the state will have first lien priority on new ad valorem production uh, and on any new um, security arrangement or, uh, or loan that is put against the ad valorem, or excuse me, against the mineral extraction that, that we would be looking for ad valorem on. Uh, but it, it's basically a reversal of the policy that we put forward uh, last session to terminate uh, the lien priority and, and insert ourselves first in line. So uh, it was kind of a, a redo, uh, Chairman Biteman. And uh, if, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them based on my recollection. But it's uh, just one tweak of a change that I think addresses some of the concerns that we'll probably hear about in public testimony. Ah, thank you, Mr. Uh, Senator Rothfuss. Uh, committee, any questions for Senator Rothfuss on this bill before we jump into public comment? Not seeing any. Mary Beth, who do we have uh, lined up to testify? Mr. Chairman, it looks like we have Mr. Novotny. Perfect. Commissioner Novotny, welcome. And you're on mute, sir. There good, you go. good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear us? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, my name is Bill Novotny, uh, speaking on behalf of the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. I'm joined today uh, by uh, newly uh, sworn in representative, Mr. Barry Crago, who in his capacity as our civil deputy has been very involved, uh, not only in the drafting of this bill, but in actual collections of delinquent uh, mineral production taxes where this lien priority uh, bill that we initially worked on and then the work over the interim that has led us to the Senate file 41 draft. Uh, so he uh, will be an invaluable uh, resource as we get into this. Uh, on behalf of the Commissioners Association, if your local commissioner has not had the opportunity to speak with you yet, we fully support this bill and would like to see it move forward. Uh, one of the issues that, that Senator Rothfuss brought up was that deletion of language on uh, page three. We think that is critical. Uh, we don't think that any county would want to be in the position where they were issuing that certification because of, uh, of just potential other issues with that. Uh, we do believe that this uh, effective date is good. If, if we could have anything on our laundry list that we would like to see, obviously we would like to see counties put in super priority, but we do believe that this bill uh, in cleaning up the statute that we enacted several years ago is the right step in the right direction. Uh, and we would stand for any questions that you have and I would actually yield uh, to Representative Crago for his final thoughts. Representative Crago, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was just going to comment and say I, I really see this as sort of a cleanup of, of what we did last time. This language, the, the two provisions that are identical that are being stricken, the treasurers got really nervous about that language after it was put in the bill. And, you know, I, I had already advised our treasurer that we would not be doing that anyways. And I believe most county attorneys advise their treasurers the same, that it puts too much risk on the, the counties because they don't know what is hanging out there as far as liabilities and liens and and we wouldn't know until after production is actually reported and, and that could you know that could take months under the old system and then on in the paragraph e regarding the tax sale that that provision that's being stricken just a little bit of explanation again the treasurers were worried about that they felt like that language and i tend to agree uh painted them into a corner where that was their only ability to collect rather than using their whole toolbox that they currently have. And so that's why we asked that that language be taken out as well so that the treasurers and the county attorney's offices around the state still have the ability to use all their tools in their toolbox rather than just a tax sale. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, any questions from the committee? 
questions. You guys got off easy. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mary Beth, do we have anybody else wishing to testify on Senate File 41? Looks like we do, Mr. Chairman. I just admitted Mr. Rodman again. All right. Jeremiah, floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, again, Jeremiah Riemann with the Wyoming County Commissioners Association. As uh, the good uh, commissioner mentioned, this is a priority for our association. We do uh, fully support it. Um, I don't want to duplicate uh, much of the testimony here, but I'd like to just provide a little bit more uh, color uh, to it. Um, as I think all of you know, uh, mineral production uh, happens uh, roughly 18 months before collections uh, of uh, those uh, taxes, those mineral ad valorem taxes that are due. And so the concern uh, with the language that was inserted on uh, pages uh, three and four uh, is that you could have a situation where a, 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 an owner of a, a current asset could walk into the treasurer's office and receive a certification uh, that uh, the uh, that the taxes were indeed uh, paid in full, uh, and that uh, by giving that certification under this language, uh, we could end up in a situation where uh, the asset was sold uh, and uh, the uh, liability was indeed not completely paid uh, because of that lag that would exist. And so um, uh, the solution is just to take this language out and not leave that risk that might exist out there. Mr. Craig is right. Uh, hopefully no county would ever do this, but it, it was a risk uh, that existed uh, with this language. Um, and, and it could be done unknowingly by uh, any county official. And, and we just didn't want that to happen. Mr. Chairman, uh, the other uh, issue uh, that's referenced on page four, uh, line 16 and 17, uh, deals with foreclosure of assets. Uh, and the, the language there ties foreclosure uh, to tax sales. Uh, the reality is that uh, we have many other tools, uh, as Mr. Crago said, uh, to go about uh, foreclosure it isn't just simply tax sales. So we're, we're doing uh, the treasurer some assistance by taking uh, that language out. Mr. Chairman, I hope that provides a little bit more color. Uh, I think this is a cleanup bill and, and uh, others uh, that might testify, uh, I think will support it. Mr. Chairman, we still are interested in trying to find a solution for those back uh, tax lien uh, liabilities uh, and ensuring uh, that uh, counties uh, are, are protected a, a little bit more clearly uh, so we understand where the goalposts are. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't come with a solution for that today, uh, but I do hope to work with uh, industry, both the bankers uh, and the producers uh, to try and bring something a little bit later. Um, hopefully we'll get there uh, we're not there today, uh, uh, but uh, with what is here today, I would ask for your favorable consideration, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thanks, Jeremiah, and we do have time. We've got uh, all the way till March, so you guys can get your heads together and, and come up with some solutions until we get to in person in March. Look forward to working with you guys. Uh, committee, any questions for Mr. Riemann? Not seeing any, thank you so much. Mary Beth, do we have anybody else who wishes to testify? Mr. Chairman, we do not. Okay, well, with that, I will close public comment. Uh, committee, what's your pleasure? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Senator Wasserberger. I move uh, Senate file 41 for passage. Moved by Senator Wasserberger, seconded by Senator Rothfuss. All right. Uh, are there any amendments proposed for this piece of legislation? Not seeing any amendments. Any discussion on the bill? Not seeing any. I guess I'll entertain a call for the question. Question. Question being called. Uh, will Brianna please call the roll? 
Okay, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, you are voting on Senate File 41. Senator Cooper. Aye. Senator Raffas. Aye. Senator Wasserberger. Aye. Senator Anderson. Absent. Chairman Beitman. Aye. Mr. Chairman, Senate File 41 has passed the Senate Standing Minerals Committee um, as a due pass with no amendments. Thank you very much. Uh, who would like to floor manage this lovely bill? Senator Wasserberger, thank you so much. Let me write that down so I don't forget. Great. Okay, our next item up for business, moving right along is Senate File 43, Wyoming Energy Authority Amendments. Who would like to walk us through that bill? Senator Rothfuss, you're on a roll. The floor is yours, my friend. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, just to remind the committee, we took the Infrastructure Authority and the Pipeline Authority last session and we put them together into one Wyoming Energy Authority, which basically combined and included uh, the various roles and responsibility of both of those entities and have, I think, had already good early success in, in having a one-stop shop. And we've met with some, I think, enthusiastic response uh, with some follow-on discussion about mission and recognizing that we wanted to ensure that this Wyoming Energy Authority could look at a lot of different issues and, and might not just be limited to what they previously had through infrastructure and pipeline. Uh, this piece of legislation came forward to modestly expand the scope of the responsibilities, uh, and that's done through some definitions and then some um, authority purpose. So as we walk through, uh, there's just a, a couple of amendments where in the first section on page two, uh, we're expanding the concept of natural resource associated with energy or associated natural resource to include minerals. Uh, and then the last bit, or as otherwise provided in this article. And you'll see that the purpose for that, Mr. Chairman, gets us to Romanets 8 and 9. Uh, even though maybe it's not the, the perfect fit, and if we had lots of different authorities, we, we might not uh, be incorporating uh, our work on rare earths, uh, supporting of needs of Trona industry and some of our other mineral uh, industries in the state into our energy authority. The fact of the matter is there there is no appropriate or perfectly appropriate authority for those interests and those industries to have purview over them. So as we want to be able to have advancement of both our critical materials industry and rare earths, uh, which we're seeing here, which would include for example, Trona and, and the, the rare earth mining uh, that we're contemplating in some parts of the state. And we know we have some robust deposits of those. Uh, we're adding then these two definitions in this section. And then you can see as we move on to page three at the top, we are adding responsibility to support efforts to maintain and expand the rare earth minerals industry the critical mineral materials industry, the Trona industry and other mineral industries in Wyoming. And to basically make sure that the energy authority has the ability to take responsibility in these areas, recognizing that uh, the tools that they have in their toolbox are effective in those sectors as well. And a lot of what we're doing in those sectors really do relate back into our energy industry and, and our, um, materials engineering industries. Moving on to page three, I mean, the bottom of page three, excuse me. Uh, for those that, that don't recall, one of the powers of the energy authority is to issue revenue bonds. These bonds are not backed by the full faith and credit of the state of Wyoming. Uh, this is a quasi-governmental entity, that, but it does have the authority to issue revenue bonds on projects if deemed appropriate. And this section discusses what those bonds could be directed or used for. And you see the gap here going from C to N. 
uh, is a, a series of different uh, allowances here for and, and provisions on the authority of those revenue bonds, but this is an allowance then in the new paragraph N that would allow projects to focus use of these revenue bonds on these new sections of rare earth minerals, critical materials, tron, and other materials. In other words, the their existing authority with regard to bonding would also be applicable to supporting efforts in these new areas of critical materials and rare earth minerals that they haven't had responsibility for previously act as effective July 1st. Excellent. Uh, committee, any questions uh, regarding the bill before we take public comment? Seeing none, Mary Beth, who do we have lined up to testify? Looks like we have a few, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Levine, uh, Ms. Campbell, uh, and Mr. Detai, and I will admit them now. Thank you. We'll start with ladies first. Uh, Ms. Levine, if you have a, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. My name is Jody Levin. I'm here this afternoon on behalf of the Trona industry. I want to thank the committee for their consideration of this issue over the interim. The Trona industry had actually approached uh, the committee and the Energy Authority for this consideration, as Senator Rothfuss uh, very eloquently explained. When the merger of the Infrastructure Authority and the Pipeline Authority occurred, it while it created terrific one-stop shopping, it did leave a gap for, for entities that are in the mineral industry but are not necessarily energy related. I think we are all fully cognizant of the fact that Trona and Soda Ash are not energy. They are mining and chemical manufacturing. But the industry is left without any entity to go to in the state for technical experience. And for, uh, for the assistance of, of potential uh, bonding or even helping arrange for financing uh, would be helpful to the industry as they're looking at very significant expansion projects and financing has become more difficult since uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, with that, um, Mr. Chairman, the only other entity I'd like to uh, express appreciation to is the Energy Authority itself. Uh, some of the Trona companies did uh, participate in meetings directly with the Energy Authority in contemplating this language, and we greatly appreciate their willingness to uh, expand their purview to allow this industry the same uh, expertise as uh, oil and gas. Great. Thank you, Ms. Levin. Uh, committee, any questions for our friends in the Trona patch? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move on to Travis Detai. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Travis Detai, Executive Director of the Wyoming Mining Association. And uh, for the benefit of uh, Senator Cooper, uh, being a new member of the committee, the Mining Association uh, represents the coal companies, the Trona and Natural Soda Ash companies, uh, Bentonite, Uranium, and we also have uh, rare earths that are coming in under our purview as well. So. Uh, uh, Pretty much just to echo what uh, what Mrs. Levin said and Senator Rothfuss uh, uh, explained the bill very well. Um, we believe this is a good idea. Uh, when you look at uh, the direction we're going uh, as far as the extraction industries in Wyoming and with the um, uh, continued contraction of our coal customer base um, and with the state being where it is, we're still very reliant on minerals. And we're going to be reliant on uh, on extraction and minerals for a long time, and we think that this uh, this concept of putting uh, um, uh, specifically rare earths and some of our other minerals under the purview of the of the Energy Authority uh, is going to just help uh, to develop some of those new uh, new resources that we're going to need to, uh, to to provide revenue and jobs in the future. So we think this is a good idea. And uh, I would also like to, to compliment the Energy Authority. We will be getting together with them, uh, the Trona industry and the Energy Authority to start discussing some things uh, and how we can make this work uh, here in the near future. And uh, again, we think it's a good idea and we would uh, uh, respectfully ask the committee to, to move this bill affirmatively. 
Great, thank you, Mr. I would stand Detail. for any questions, Mr. Chairman. All right, anybody have any questions for Mr. Detai? Uh, Mr. Detai, how are things looking in the rare earth and critical materials in Wyoming? Do we have any projects currently underway? You know, we have, uh, there is one project that is uh, in a holding pattern right now up in the northwest or the northeast corner of the state. Uh, that is rare element resources uh, uh, project going up there. Um, they're hopeful they can get through some of their permitting uh, hassles that they've been having for years now. Um, I think at the federal level, uh, we've seen some uh, interest, uh, bipartisan interest on developing rare earths uh, domestically. Uh, I think that company is positioned very well, well, uh, very well to take advantage of some of that if we can move forward on it. And we also have a new company that's uh, exploring and has some uh, a little project in the works in Northern Albany County. Uh, so yeah, it's out there, there is interest and uh, anything we can do to make that process easier so that we can get those out of the ground, I think we need to do it. I agree, thank you, uh, Travis. Um, any other questions? Yes, Senator Rothfuss. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, we, we do have a project potentially in Albany County, and I just learned this year that Albany County has rare earths as a result of that project and had no idea of it. So it's it's nice that we've got uh, some possibilities in my backyard, too. I'm glad Mr. Detai and the Mining Association are, are working with that team as well. Mr. Chairman, if I could just add on, we have rare earths all over the place. Uh, they're only uh, uh, economically viable in certain places, but Wyoming's got them, and I think looking forward in the future, we need to, we really need to make a conscious effort as a state to, to try to develop some of those. Absolutely. And I think we're going to see that pivot here shortly to those uh, new industries and hopefully they'll help uh, ease the, the pain from the coal decline. Thank you, Mr. Detai. Um, next up looks like Aaron Cambo. Um, Thank welcome. you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Um, I am the Wyoming State Geologist and Director of the Wyoming State Geological Survey, and we are conducting research into rare earth elements. Um, and as, as Mr. Deeptai stated, we have, uh, there are a number of prospects around the state. And the Geologic Survey is an agency that's tasked with studying, understanding, publishing, and providing advice and services on uh, mineral resources. And so we do provide that for the state. Uh, but I would like to say that um, there's a gap between distributing our work and getting exploration underway. And as a state employee, I can't advocate or would never advocate for or against a bill, but um, I do see a, a good collaboration with the Wyoming Energy Authority in helping to get the research that we're doing into the hands of the exploration companies. Um, if you had any questions about what mineral resources are being explored for in terms of critical minerals or rare earth elements in the state, I could elaborate on that, but there are opportunities, definitely. Certainly, if you could give us a, a brief overview of that, Ms. Campbell, that would be great. Uh, well, as Mr., thank you, Mr. Chairman, as Mr. Detai mentioned, there is the Bear Lodge deposit uh, in the northeastern corner of the state, which are primarily heavy rare earth elements uh, the only other rare earth element mine in, in the United States is Mountain Pass, which is light rare earth elements. We have heavy rare earth elements, which are more rare. Um, they are a little more difficult to process and to refine and can be more expensive. So there have been some market hurdles for those. Um, additionally, there is a company that's looking at paleoplacers in Bighorn, uh, in the Bighorn Basin. And that's the grass Grass Creek area. And what the paleoplacers are, are black sandstones. These are Cretaceous sandstones that have concentrations of titanium, vanadium, rare earth elements, zirconium, hafnium, niobium, um, and other, other elements as well. And the geologic survey is also exploring for those same sands in southwestern and central Wyoming. Um, we have a project and also the School of Energy Resources is working on a project on Kemmerer coals, looking at uh, rare earth elements and cobalt in those coals. We're looking at the larger Kemmerer coal field and uh, the School of Energy Resources is looking at the Kemmerer coal mine. SER has also put in a couple of grants that we um, are supporting their work on those grants, looking at um, rare earth elements in the Powder River Basin and also in the Kemmerer area. 
Um, there, our largest project at the survey are two um, projects that are in collaboration with the United States Geologic Survey um, under the Earth MRI funding model. We're looking in the central Laramie range uh, at rare earth elements, titanium, van vanadium, and a variety of copper mineralization. And then in the Medicine Bow Mountains, that's a huge area with a number of platinum group elements, rare earth elements, chromite, nickel, copper, vanadium, uranium, magnesium, um, tantalum, bismuth, and many others, as well as copper, gold, and silver. So those are the primary areas that we're examining at this time. Wow, that's great. Uh, off the top of your head, are most of these areas open for mining where these deposits are located? Or are we going to have some hurdles there as far as the uh, uh, who owns the minerals, whether it be federal or state or private? Um, in terms of the medicine bows, that's primarily forest service. And we're, we're avoiding the wilderness areas of entirely, of course. Um, the Central Laramie Range, there is some private land in southwestern and central Wyoming. It's a variety um, of federal, state, and private land. Great. Thank you. Committee, any questions? Not seeing any. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. I really appreciate your testimony. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Next up, it looks like Mr. Luthi from the governor's office. Randall, how are you today, sir? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. There's that mute button. I'm there still getting used to that. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chairman and uh, members of the committee. Thank you for taking the time to look at this bill today. Uh, the governor is very supportive of the bill. Uh, we've been very pleased where the Wyoming Energy Authority has come in the last six months. Uh, they've made remarkable progress. And it's, it's just a it was pointed out that there really wasn't a place for these critical elements and uh, important critical uh, minerals and rare earth elements to really be shepherded. And it just seems that WA is going to be able to do that very well. Uh, right now, the WEA has uh, assumed the position of kind of an informal gatekeeper. And so as potential projects come in, potential questions come in, uh, they're very useful in uh, helping uh, determine rather we should send the questions, the research to SER, School of Energy Resources, my apologies, Mr. Chairman, the Wyoming Business uh, uh, Council, uh, or the uh, uh, EORI, uh, they all work together under the, uh, with the auspices of the WEA. Uh, certainly appreciated the testimony of uh, Mr. Detai and uh, uh, Ms. Levine. Couldn't agree more. And uh, 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 Aaron Campbell, really appreciate the history. Uh, one of the things I would point out, uh, the company that bought Occidental uh, land holdings that we've heard we dealt with a lot last, or earlier this year uh, has also put rare earths as one of those things that they would very much like to uh, develop in Wyoming. And if you wouldn't mind just a little bit of latitude, Mr. Uh, Acting Chairman for Senator Wasserberger. Sure, absolutely. Senator. Wass, Senator <laughs> Wasserberger. I, I'm home in freedom today and I dug out an old jacket and it has my legislative pin on it. And I just want you to know that the jacket still fits as long as I don't have to button it. So, thank you. Uh, Thank, you, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thanks, Randall. Any questions for, uh, looks like, oh, Mr. Detai. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, I just wanted to, uh, I misspoke a little bit earlier in my testimony when I mentioned that the, the, the Trona industry was getting together to have some conversations with the Energy Authority. What I meant to say was the Wyoming Business Council rather than the Energy Authority. So I just wanted to correct the, the record for that. Duly noted. Thank you, Mr. Detail. Thank you. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Luthi? Seeing none, thank you, sir. We look forward to working with you in the governor's office on, on this in the future. Uh, Mary Beth, that looks like all I have. Uh, do you have anybody else that wishes to testify? Mr. Chairman, I do not. Okay. Well, with that, we'll close public comment. Committee, what is your pleasure? Looks like we're going to move the move by Wasserberger, seconded by Rothfuss. How about that? All right, uh, Senator Rothfuss. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 
and obviously this is an excellent bill. Uh, we, we need to have a responsibility and a responsible authority for these projects, but I did just want to tack on one other topic that falls under this purview that wasn't mentioned. And that's, uh, uh, as we look to thorium as a future energy technology, and, and we've been trying to work with the thorium industry in the state of Wyoming to identify opportunities and partnerships there. Uh, I think it's important to realize that, that thorium is going to be qualified, obviously, under these definitions. And thorium is co-deposited with most of the heavier rare earths to the point where it's a, it's a waste product, right? Nobody knows what to do with the thorium and it's a liability for those larger projects. Uh, if we could find a way to use that thorium as, a, as an asset rather than a liability as part of our overall uh, picture and, and strategy, that, that would obviously position us very well. And, and I think with this new authority going to the energy authority, uh, they could be contemplating those types of synergies. So with that, um, call for the question if there's no further debate. Uh, Senator Cooper has a question. Is there, a, what's our connection as, as uh, the legislature with the energy authority? Um, do we have a presence on it or are we completely separate from it? Senator Rothfuss, you want to answer it, or Senator Cooper's question? Absolutely. So the Energy Authority is set up as, and it was originally intended to be set up as a quasi-governmental authority that, that was not directly under the oversight of the state. And there were purposes for that with regard to constitutionality of partnerships and investment. So we don't have legislators, we don't have executive branch directly as members or entities on the uh, authority. So the authority is comprised of a board, an oversight board. And uh, if you look to the statutes, which we don't have in front of us right now, but it includes members of oil and gas, members of pipeline, members of uh, transmission and, and then other energy related typically uh, industry as, as the minimums for the appoint appointees. And they have oversight, then that board has oversight of the operations of the office. There's a director uh, that is selected by that board and, and uh, a relatively small and modest staff. And, and then they do have a, a series of tools at their disposal. And it's the fact that we provided them with those tools and the bonding authority and some of the other uh, features that gives them the flexibility to work in partnership and more nimbly with business and industry than a government agency directly could. Uh, that is the reason that we are not directly linked to them, that we do not have direct oversight and, and that the governor's office also does not have direct oversight, but, but has partnerships. So it's created by the legislature, but as this sort of quasi-governmental entity. And, and I hope that answers Senator Cooper's questions. Thank you very much. I call a question, Mr. Chairman. And you're okay. on mute, Mr. Chairman. There you go. There we go. Uh, I was just going to ask on the thorium question, Ms. Senator Office, do we need an amendment for that or is this language suffi sufficient? Mr. Chairman, I made sure the language was sufficient when we were drafting it earlier. So it's good. Okay. Uh, no further amendments. All right. Uh, question being called. Will Mrs. Davidson please call the roll? Yeah, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, you are taking a roll call vote on Senate File 43. Senator Cooper. Aye. Senator Raffis. Aye. Senator Wasserberger. Aye. Senator Anderson. Excuse, uh, absent. Chairman Beitman. Uh, aye. Mr. Chairman, Senate File 43 has passed the Senate Standing Minerals Committee uh, with no amendments. Thank you very much. So who wants to volunteer to lead that one on the floor? Senator Wasserberger, it's all yours, my friend. Mr. Chairman, I just want you to know that I don't want to foremanage the next two bills, so I thought I'd volunteer early. <laughs> and Mr. Chairman, that's why I hadn't been volunteering because I was suspecting I'd be floor managing the next two bills. Uh, you, I've got the best <laughs> committee right here. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. With that being said, we'll move on to uh, Senate File 61. Actually, do you guys need a break or are we good? 219. We're way ahead of schedule. Yeah, so. I think I'm okay still. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. I don't, I don't want to work you guys too hard here. So here we go with Senate File 61, amortization of sales and use tax. 
who would like to walk us through this puppy? Senator Rothfuss, floor is yours. Um, I'm muted. Let's see. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nope, I'm not muted. Good deal. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this legislation, the I'll, I'll talk about the concept and then how it works. Uh, I had discussions a number of years ago, and, and it was actually directed at our, our manufacturing sales tax exemption when there was a, a company that was looking at, at doing a manufacturing facility uh, in Wyoming related to an energy project that, that I thought was a hopeful project, didn't end up moving forward. But in those discussions, I, I was uh, contemplating uh, with uh, the project organizer, you know, does this manufacturing sales tax exemption that we have in statute, is, is that effective? Is that useful? And the individual said, it's really only useful from the cash flow standpoint for the first few years. After, after the cash flow comes in, uh, in, in the opinion of this individual, it didn't make much difference. Uh, but up front, it makes a heck of a lot of difference uh, just in the beginning. And the suggestion that, that came from that conversation was, well, what if it were amortized over time and, and was basically absorbed into an appropriate cash flow instead of an upfront cost that had to be financed? And that particular individual said from, from his perspective, it was basically the same. Uh, and then I ended up having some follow-up conversations with uh, one of our good economists here at the university that works on, on energy economics and policy and asked, in your experience, you know, what are good policies that, that allow us to incentivize projects in Wyoming uh, that don't necessarily cost the state an arm and a leg? And this was the topic that, that came out of that conversation where – in typical circumstances, obviously, unless it's manufacturing right now, but any other project that has a substantial upfront cost, the sales tax on all the cost of the materials ends up getting rolled into the financing for the project. So 6% of the project cost is then amortized over the lifetime of the project at whatever the cost of capital is for the industry. And that could be, we'll say arbitrarily, 6 to 10%. Uh, so there is a substantial cost and there's a cost that's carried over the lifetime of that project. Uh, the concept here is, well, what if the state were to amortize it instead of having it forced to be a part of the financing? And that would provide lower cost to industry and hopefully more projects to the state of Wyoming. But even if there weren't more projects, we should at least break even on it. So breaking even should theoretically be the minimum and then more projects because we're, we're effectively sharing in, in the, the wealth generation with industry. So Mr. Chairman, that's what this bill does. Uh, if we walk through the pieces of this bill, uh, most everything is in one paragraph, this Romanet 12 that you'll see on page two. Uh, the intent here is for large projects, though uh, we had some earlier conversations about small projects or, or even doing this for individuals, and, and maybe that's a future discussion. But uh, at this point in time, it's for large projects uh, where the projects would have expenditures subject to Wyoming sales and use tax in Wyoming. That's a key point here. The project is to be completed in Wyoming uh, with two years sales and use tax over Five million dollars. Excuse me, on a project in excess of five million dollars. So not five million dollars of sales and use tax, but a five million dollar project subject to sales and use tax. Very different things. Uh, and it would provide then an opportunity for industry to work with the the Department of Revenue to amortize the sales and use taxes during the expected lifetime of the project, not to exceed a period of 10 years. Uh, the department shall provide amortization schedules, fees, terms, and conditions for each project that is approved for amortization under this paragraph. And there's a lot that goes into that. We had a lot of discussion about the idea of, of having some, some fees or basically an interest rate associated with it that, that might keep up with inflation. So this language allows a lot of flexibility to make sure that the state isn't losing on the terms. 
And we also talked about whether we should put in explicit parameters to provide backstops about uh, sort of the outstanding uh, net present value of the, the, I guess, depreciated value is what I should say, of the, the materials that, that were purchased or, or whatever the, the sales and use tax is, is against to ensure that the value of it is maintained throughout the amortization schedule. Uh, but as, as you'll recall, we, we ended up comfortable that um, with the flexibility given in this paragraph, that would be something that would be taken, up, uh, taken on itself by the Department of Revenue. Uh, importantly, the amortization agreement shall include a lien upon the property of the project for which sales and use taxes are amortized under this paragraph. So we'll have a lien. And then the next sentence is our lesson learned from severance tax, where from the very beginning of this project in statute, these liens will have first priority. They will be the superior lien to all other liens. So our 6%, if that's what it is, 4%, well, it, it won't be actually. Two point, I should note that. This is only on the state portion of sales and use tax at this point. So this is really only on 2.8%. We could potentially amend it. And we heard in testimony at our last meeting that counties would like the opportunity to participate in this, but this doesn't allow for that yet. Uh, we could either do that through amendment or honestly through a next piece of legislation was what I was contemplating instead of uh, mucking about in this bill and complicating it, doing it in multiple steps was, was the reason I, I don't have an amendment at this time. So it's the 2.8% of the 4% that goes to the state that this relates to. Then the state would have a first priority lien on that 2.8%. And remember, it's it's over. It, it's a, a lien against real property that's valued at a hundred for every two point eight they owe us. So we've got a pretty secure lien. That that those are terms and conditions I would always take if you can. Uh, <laughs> if you can have that much priority. I don't think we have any risk of losing that two point eight percent over the lifetime due to bankruptcy if we have that superior position. Uh, failure to pay allows all uh, collection uh, tools of the department to be used. The department shall adopt rules uh, and regulations to move this forward. Uh, another key component is we, we and I, I skipped it above, my apologies, Mr. Chairman, but we also request that the department once a year, or not less than once a year, publish fixed terms, fees, and rates that can be demonstrated to industry so they can understand clearly what some of the options are that are available to them. This doesn't require those be the terms that are accepted by the department. Uh, so you can enter into a negotiation, but uh, you'll recall it was Representative McGuire that, that thought it would be beneficial kind of from an advertising standpoint for industry to understand what would be or could be available directly to them. So that's in there. Um, most of the rest of the paragraph is uh, there's, there's some discussion of not holding over liabilities to vendors uh, to, to ensure that there's appropriate tax collection consistent with other sections of statute uh, beginning on page, is this page three? Page three line uh, nine is definition of project that could be used. We tried to be as broad as possible. Uh, so it, it, it incorporates land building or other improvements all real and personal property, including machinery and equipment, results in increase to the assessed valuation of the county or counties in which the project will be located. So we tried to be broad on what a project was, but tried to ensure that it, it fit the spirit of the concept of a project. And then when you look to the bottom of page three and onto page four, it just talks about distribution. And the fact that the distribution would go through the standard channels uh, that they would otherwise go through once the amortized payments were brought to the state. So it, it really isn't any substantive policy, just making sure that the distribution goes well. That's the bill, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you, Senator. Any questions on the bill so far? 
Not seeing any questions. It looks like uh, Director Noble is in the waiting room. Um, Mary Beth, could you let him in and let's hear what uh, Director Noble has to say from the Department of Revenue. Hmm. Looks like we lost him. Nope, here he comes. He's back. Can you hear us, Director? Looks like you're on mute, sir. I don't see him. Nope. There he is. There we go. <laughs> <clears throat> New technology yet again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Dan Noble, Director of the Department of Revenue. Um, I'm, I heard something that I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood about the bill, um, and, and maybe I just need clarification as to where that, where that resides. This amortization of sales tax will only apply to the state's portion of the sales tax. Is that, did I hear that right, or is when I, when I read it on, on line six, it just says expenditures subject to Wyoming's sales and use tax. That would be all sales tax. I'm just curious as to whether this is limited somewhere else in the bill that I'm just, I haven't seen. Um, I, I'm Senator concerned. Roth will probably have an answer for you, Senator Roth. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman and Director Noble, uh, it's not explicit in the bill, but it's based on its location in the bill that uh, our LSO attorneys have assured me that it only applies to the the two point eight percent that goes to the state of the four um, percent. I, I would like to be able to be more specific in exactly how that's laid out, uh, but I, I've been through that conversation with them, and we can double check on that and get Mr. Fuller uh, to provide you with his analysis on on what leads to that. And I, I should probably know that better as well, Director. But um, that, that certainly is my understanding and, and not a passive understanding, but through conversation with staff. Okay. I, I think it probably could be cleaner if it pointed to the, the, uh, the um, taxation rate statute in 104, because that really is the state sales and use or the state's sales tax. And then um, chapter 16 has the, com the com uh, component of it, which is the use tax piece of it. Um, it might make it clearer because I think that that our fiscal note, um, number one, it's indeterminable because we were concerned about local options as well, and we wouldn't really know uh, until the project was actually came forth um, what this would look like as far as it relates to it. Um, it does answer um, one of our questions, which was how do we deal with something like a specific purpose option tax that was on for two or three years and ended when in fact we're amortizing this this tax over a 10 year period, it would create kind of a conundrum. But what you what you just basically said, I think probably um, makes this much easier to deal with because we're, we're dealing with the state's component of the uh, of the sales tax and not local options. Um, it may we might may run into some administrative issues because somehow we're going to have to parse the state's component and say that part of what is reported as sales tax is going to have to be put in the payment arrangement and, and amortized over a certain period where the rest of it will go directly to the counties. And I'm not so sure that our system is set up to do that currently. Um, doesn't mean we don't do payment plans all the time. I mean, we, whenever a taxpayer is delinquent on their taxes, one of the things we try to do to stop penalty associated with moving forward is get them on a payment arrangement, which stops that penalty. So we, we, we have some uh, experience in this realm. Um, as it relates to interest rates, currently the only thing in statute is, is what we assess on every uh, payment plan that we have out there and any delinquent taxes, and that is prime plus 4%, and that's defined in statute. Um, what you're talking about, I believe, is some sort of a negotiated rate, and I think that would probably need some clarification as to, where, as to what my authority is to negotiate that rate on, on these types of arrangements. Um, we certainly not opposed to doing it, um, but I think we would probably want some, uh, if, no, if nothing else, some sideboards on, okay, what are, what are our uh, limitations as it relates to that? 
Um, you know, the uh, can't say that we don't do this a lot. We do payment plans every single day. Uh, this would uh, uh, be something that, because of the fact that it's limited to the state's general fund, would be much easier to administer than what we had originally contemplated. Because we were we were looking at this bill as if it was all sales tax associated with the uh, uh, with the project. Uh, this cleans it up a bunch. Um, I think our our only other comment would be there probably is going to be some administrative costs associated with getting the system to separate what tax is under the payment arrangement and what tax goes directly to the counties. Um, that that I think we can we can talk to our our uh, computer vendor and find out what that would look like. Thank you, Mr. Noble. It looks like Senator Rothfuss has a question. Certainly. Senator Thank you, Rothfuss. Mr. Chairman and, and Director. Um, I, I wanted to respond to a couple of your thoughts and, and ask a couple of questions. And um, yeah, with, with regard to the separation and if, if pointing specifically in statute helps, then, then we can look into that. We probably won't have that ability today, but we could bring that mm -hmm. amendment. We'll take note of it and try and provide that clarity. In fact, if, if you could help us uh, and, and work with um, Mr. Fuller uh, on, on that amendment so that it clarifies appropriately, I think that would be useful. Certainly. Uh, with regard to the local options, um, as I mentioned, I, I think that's a longer term objective, but it does seem harder, obviously, uh, for the reasons that you note. And I actually think that the localities, and we had testimony on this last time, I don't know if you were watching, but when we did our last uh, committee meeting, it was clear that counties wanted to be able to participate and, and municipalities mm -hmm. wanted to be able to participate because they saw the value in it. Uh, so I, I guess I would ask you to start thinking about how to make that work as a next step, because I think that is the appropriate next step that if we move this forward, we'll want to be able to go to, even if this bill isn't where we do that. Um, sideboards on rates. The, the intent is really not to do any more than, than, than the minimum where we talked about inflation last time, which obviously substantially less than what you mentioned. I think you said prime plus four. Um, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're contemplating two or, or whatever, whatever inflation is at this point. Uh, is the language insufficient to achieve that? Because I, what we put in, and this was kind of after our discussion with regard to, I'm looking for the language, the department shall establish and publish not less than Wait, that's not it. The department, there we go. The department shall establish amortization schedules, fees, terms, and conditions for each project that is approved for amortization under this paragraph. We gave pretty broad range because we wanted to make sure that you could do what made sense, both for the state and for industry, recognizing that just saying 2%, I don't think that's a good choice on a 10-year project. I wouldn't just say 2%. I'd be comfortable with it on a three-year project. So... Do you have any ideas? I mean, do you want more language than that? Or, or what could we do to help you? Um, Noble. Mr. Chairman, Senator Rothfuss, I think one of the things that I'm probably <laughs> um, uh, concerned with is I I'm probably not the only person that probably needs to weigh in on this. Um, I think the state treasurer and, and, uh, and those folks need to weigh in on it because obviously there's a cost of capital to the state for having to to move this out over an extended period of time versus having it all up front as well. There's a cost of capital associated with with uh, what the state foregoes to give this up um, over an extended period of time. It doesn't mean that it's not a good idea. It just means that mm -hmm. that's something that probably needs to be taken into consideration. And I'm probably not the person to talk to about that, but. I understand the, the idea here is to actually offer an economic incentive to, to, to allow people to, to spread out this liability over time. I certainly understand that. As a matter of fact, when I was working with uh, the, uh, uh, there was a committee on, on wind projects, that was one of the things that was discussed was, was uh, the, the uh, types of, of issues that, uh, that they're faced with because the cost of capital up front for them mm -hmm. on a, you know, on a billion dollar project is a, is a huge lift for them. And that was one of the things that was discussed. And, and uh, um, so I understand 
the the need for this and and the the uh, opportunity for an, an offering an incentive. I think the 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 real issue I'm faced with is okay. What I think might be a really good deal for the industry and negotiate with the industry may be looked at on, by some as being something less than a good deal or too too sweetheart of a deal. And um, I think that probably is, is where I, I see a little reluctance on my part is, is mm -hmm. okay, this could become a problem. Um, and that doesn't mean it's, that it's not a good idea. I think it actually has some has merit here because it's been talked about a lot as, as, over the years. Um, I just wonder if it may be better to look at tying it to something like the consumer price index for industrial products or something like that, that the, the rate associated with this would be tied to something that is, that is tangible as opposed to negotiating a rate um, uh, without some sort of guidance as to what, what your intentions are. Uh, that's, that's my thought. Um, yeah, I see it. I will certainly act in, in whatever capacity you guys want me to. I, I hope you understand that. Yeah, Thank Mr. You, Mr. Paul, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, Director, it, it's a very good point you make. And, and when you contemplate, if we don't provide explicit provisions or direction, I can see a circumstance where you'd have to be contemplating a, a prudent investor approach as opposed to uh, where at that point, obviously, it would be what the state's uh, loss in revenue, assuming it was invested, that the treasurer would look at as opposed to what we might be comfortable with, which would just be a CPI uh, adjusted rate or something along those lines. Um, yeah, thank thank you for that. And I, I, I see your point. We might need to be more explicit just to achieve giving you the flexibility to use a CPI. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Director? Um, you know, the, the, the remaining issues that I have with this um, are probably just trying to figure out um, how, how we book the liability. And this is what happens when we deal with a normal payment plan. We know what the liability is. They've either reported it to us or we've uh, actually created a return for them on their behalf to generate what the liability actually is. Then we set up the payment arrangement against that liability. That involves um, a system that is designed to look to that liability in the tax jurisdiction in which it, it was generated. And that means local option taxes as well as the state uh, state sales tax and the state's portion as well as the local's portion of that same tax. In doing that, it's it's treated as one tax, if you will. And the, the segregation is made as, as, as one mathematical equation at the time that, uh, that, that we uh, distribute the tax to the local governments. Um, what we have to do under this scenario is say, okay, here's the liability. Let's say it's um, uh, $100,000. And of that, $45,000 goes immediately to the county. And this other $55,000 component, which would uh, originally go to the general fund, is going to be set aside as a liability and paid out or amortized, if you will, over a 10 year period. That's something that our system does not currently contemplate. It either sets the whole thing aside and sets it up as a payment arrangement, or um, it, it just looked, it's looked at how does, as delinquent tax. So we're gonna have to make some system changes in order to, to separ separate what's gonna go immediately to the counties and what will go to the, the state's general fund over a 10 year period or whatever that that uh, amortized uh, period is. So there are administrative costs associated with it. And I don't, you know, we're gonna work with our, our computer vendor to find out what that would look like, but it would cost some money to get it done. Thank you, Director. Um, do you, would you have enough time with the effective date being July 1 to, if this bill were to pass, would you have the time to implement those changes or would you need some, some more time? Um, I think what we would probably have to ask, and, and I can certainly get with our computer vendor quickly, and, and um, now that I understand what the components of the current bill are, um, I could get with them and say, you know, what would it take to, to make this up? 
uh, uh, th this change and what would it cost, number one, and how much time would they need? We can get that fairly quickly. Um, and does, does this go from, from the Senate side to the House side in, in February? Is that yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. So we would may have some time to add what that would look like on, on the House side um, and give us a chance to get with the vendor and say, okay, here's what we're really looking at here. Um, so what, I think there'd be time to do it. Um, whether whether uh, July 1 is, is enough time, depending on how long this session goes out, it may not be enough. But I can certainly get that answer uh, when we when we get a chance to talk to the vendor. Thank you, Director Noble. Any questions? I thought Senator Cooper might have had a question. Senator Cooper. I'm concerned about, uh, and, and hopefully the director can help me with this, I'm concerned about the logistics it's going to create for for the project vendors. Um, on a large project like this, there may be a couple hundred vendors and they're the ones who are actually collecting that tax from the um, from the builder, if you will. So what kind of logistics are we creating? What kind of a quagmire are we creating for all of these hundreds of vendors out there who who have to go out as as I do myself and have to go out and collect that tax from from their customer and then break it out. Do which which tax do we collect and which tax don't we collect? Uh, uh, I, mean, I see. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Chairman, ahead. Senator Cooper. You you bring up a, a really good point. Um, when you look at large construction projects that we um, register, um, we'll actually receive tax not only from the actual general contractor um, who, who in some instances actually collects it from subs, but uh, in, in a lot of instances, the subs themselves report, and that could create um, a, an agreement as part of the agreement uh, where one party becomes responsible for that tax. And then, uh, you know, the, 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 the the people that they contract with ends up being responsible for it. And it may require some change, some additional changes. That's something I hadn't really contemplated, but you're right. Um, some of the, some of the really large manufacturing projects probably involve, I mean, I, I was thinking of uh, a uh, refinery that retooled here a few years ago, and there was probably, I would say 45 to 50 vendors that were involved in that process. So that could create some, some, logistical issues as it relates to who does the financing for that and who who ultimately ends up being on that lien if you will for for this uh this tax bill you know for this uh this payment arrangement or this uh, amortization it's certainly something we'd have to look at thank you uh director noble uh senator Rothfuss. yeah on that on that point mr chairman i i think it's a Definitely a good point. There might be a way to optimize that. And I wonder, I wonder if there is that that's a good one to think through at the end of the day, if it's a problem, this is obviously optional. So nobody would have to, to take advantage of it. If it was, if it was onerous and if the industry decided they didn't want to do it. And if it did just become a circumstance where each individual vendor somehow would have to do it, uh, you'd probably struggle to call it a project at that point, the vendors wouldn't want to do it. They probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't submit the paperwork and, and it would sort itself out. Um, I when, when you think about these, I envision kind of what Director Noble said, where you've got a billion dollars worth of wind turbines. Uh, it's going to be, uh, you're going to be able to find a way to consolidate that to save yourself $20 million or, or whatever the case may be in, in costs or probably even more than that over the lifetime of the project. But um, it's not going to be for everyone. And, and I'd, I'd like to find a way. And if Senator Cooper has any ideas on how we could streamline it, it would be, it would be great if there were a, a way to make it more seamless. I mean, you could technically just have all of the sales tax paid and then you could even credit back against receipts or something along those lines, um, which could be done through rule and regulation, right? There's nothing here that says not to do it that way. So that, that might be an approach. I don't know whether that would be better or worse, though, honestly. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of brainstorming ideas that might decrease the complexity, but would probably screw something else up. But it, it's, a, it's certainly a good, um, it's a good point to contemplate, and I, I don't know if there is a perfect solution to it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you, Senator. Uh, Director Noble, do you have anything else to add or? Um, Mr. Chairman, I think there's probably one, and, and I'm going to add this to the, uh, um, the conundrum that Senator Cooper um, presented, and that is um, not, not only the liability and how you structure it so that, that it can be set aside, but who, who do we file the lien against? That's going to be uh, a significant issue as well. Um, and I think that's probably going to be part of this negotiation that we're talking about here. Um, and it might be something where we do actually get the tax in first and then and then credit the receipts back um, associated with a component of it, but back to a specific entity and then the lien ends up being filed against that entity. That's probably um, how this would have to work. I'm just, I'm kind of brainstorming here, but I also recognize that this is, uh, uh, it's kind of uncharted territory and we're probably gonna to have to think a little outside the box anyway. Yeah, Mr. Okay. Chairman, following up on that, I know I, I think what Director Noble just mentioned actually makes it seem like the only way to do it is to back credit it appropriately because you need the lien you, you need the owner, the final owner and operator of whatever it is that was purchased as the project uh, to be credited in some way. They, they need to be the, the recipient of the, the loan, if you want to call it that. And, and the lien needs to be tied to that instrument and tied back to the equipment that they own. Otherwise, this is never going to work. So, yeah, I think, <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that probably is the only way to make it roll. Um, if, you, if you had it all parted out into individual subcontracts, then you wouldn't be able to apply the lien because they would no longer have the asset um, in that circumstance. So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good discussion point. I think that helps to clarify. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Director Noble. Um, Senator Thank you, Cooper, did you have anything else you wanted to ask or, or did that answer your question? Okay. All right. Thank you, Director Noble. Uh, looks like uh, next up is Pete Obermuller from PAW. Go ahead and let Pete in. Let's see. There he is. Good afternoon, Pete. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Apologize for the delay there. Watching uh, as a, a uh, just as an audience, and then getting kicked into uh, testimony as about a, a, a 15 second delay there. So um, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Mr. Chairman, for offering some comments on this. Um, my name is Pete Obermuller. I'm the president of the Petroleum Association of Wyoming. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just for the benefit of Senator Cooper uh, as a new committee member, a new senator, first of all, congratulations. Welcome to the Minerals Committee. Uh, glad to see you here. Uh, the Petroleum Association is the trade association for the natural gas and oil industry in Wyoming. We have uh, um, a little over 200 uh, individual members uh, that represent uh, upstream producers, midstream pipelines and gathering and, and processing, downstream refiners. Uh, we also represent uh, a, a great many oil field service companies that and, and others that, or that orbit the oil and gas production space, including environmental consultants and geologists and uh, engineers and uh, attorneys and those sorts of things. Uh, all told, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the committee, uh, the oil and gas industry in Wyoming uh, accounts for about $5 billion in economic output for the state of Wyoming, uh, which is uh, more than double of the next two top industries in the state. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, with respect to this bill, um, I appreciated Senator Ross's discussion about um, where it came from and, and uh, in terms of where it came from in, 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 in his development. Uh, PAW's involvement in it kind of stemmed from a, a little bit of a different um, angle and, and the bill's kind of gone through a journey since then and so it has a little less impact for us than it did than we thought about it having it at the, in the outset. In the outset, what we were talking about, Mr. Chairman, it came out of discussions that we have on a little bit of a broken record um, uh, over the course of legislative sessions about uh, tax incentives and other other ways to help support industry and, and making sure that industry is uh, viable and that Wyoming stays competitive with its competitor states. And uh, uh, one of the studies about that dates back to 2000 at the University of Wyoming. 
uh, that talked about uh, one of the, the solutions they talked about in terms of, of supporting industry was um, less so tax incentives on the on the back end, but figuring out ways to reduce capital input on the front end, and that that actually those those uh, researchers found um, uh, has a, a, a pretty big impact. So uh, Senator Rothfuss, to his credit, started thinking about this amortization idea as part of that. So if we could amortize, amortize sales and use tax at the front end, that would actually perhaps be a more effective uh, means for helping the energy industry recover. Uh, then uh, Senator Cooper kind of uh, previewed where, where this ended up is when we started looking more, more deeply into it, uh, it became pretty apparent that in terms of a large project from an upstream oil and gas producer, uh, it is the vendors, in fact, who uh, end up paying that sales and use tax, they simply, they bill as part of the, uh, of, the of their uh, you know, package of goods and services to the operator uh, for that sales and use. So at the end of the day, the vendors would be the ones who would amortize over the course of, of, the, of the bill. Um, PAW remains supportive of the bill. It just sort of shifts what we had initially thought. Um, we do represent small vendors, uh, and, and just as an aside, Mr. Chairman, um, uh, uh, if you'll indulge me for one second, uh, I think the Energy Rebound Program really shows that study to be true about reducing upfront capital. That was an uh, amazing investment of reducing upfront capital, and incidentally, the operators that received those turned around and ended up hiring over 130, probably over 160 once we get them all counted. Uh, uh, small Wyoming, uh, Wyoming based, Wyoming operated, Wyoming people who turned around and did all those jobs. Um, so that that is important. And that's really helpful to those small mom and pop Wyoming operators. Uh, it's a little different than when we started, but but it's still helpful, which is why PAW uh, still supports it. Uh, and uh, happy to take questions, understanding the complexity of having it shifted down to the vendors like that, whether or not they could take advantage, I, I honestly do not know. Uh, but I would hope they could, and it would be helpful to them if they could. Great. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pete, um, thanks for your testimony and, and for working on this over the last however many months it's been. And this last discussion we had, which you were listening to with Director Noble, about the the way it would potentially be implemented where you had a final project and then you effectively credited back against that final project uh do you think that might be a system that would would provide more opportunity uh for oil and gas to engage and i guess what it comes down to is do they take ownership of enough of the assets of the project once the project is put together that they could have a cohesive credit back for the entire project or are they leasing so much of it and, and still having it divided even during the operation of the project where there's not a, a cohesive enough $10 million worth of, of clear sales and use tax that, or I mean, clear project for sales and use tax that you could put the receipts together for. What are your thoughts on that? Mr. Obermiller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yeah, I appreciate it. I, I actually think, well, so a couple things. The the definition uh, that you uh, put a fine point on, Senator Rothfuss, about um, $5 million of, of taxable, um, uh, a $5 million project that is uh, under, that's taxable under sales and use, which is different than a $5 million project. That actually that definition actually really at the outset really limits how much, how many of my members could participate anyway. Uh, individual wells, um, even larger ones, uh, would, would likely have trouble meeting that definition uh, uh, under, under sales and use. There, there could, some of the bigger ones could. It really is more of the, um, the larger, maybe uh, tank batteries, um, gas processing, those sorts of things uh, where it would. But, but more to your question, once the initial construction is over, um, the sales and use uh, is, is um, uh, in comparison with severance and ad valorem is nominal and wouldn't, and, 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 and there just wouldn't be enough to, to capture it in that place, in that circumstance either. It's really the initial construction and operation that, 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 um, uh, that it, uh, brings about the immediate sales and use tax obligation. Quick follow-up. Yes, follow-up. 
if I'm doing a, you know, if I'm developing a pad of wells though, and, and I call the pad, my project, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know how many of those wells I'll get drilled in two years. If, if, if I've got a two year span of time and I have to exceed $5 million of sales and use costs in two years, but it seems to me that, that if my pad is the project, I'd get a lot higher than $5 million in, in two years on developing that pad in, in terms of, of sales and use, wouldn't I? Mr. Obermiller? <clears throat> uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and I see Senator Cooper probably has some comments about this. I think he has some expertise here, but um, I, I honestly, I, who, who knows? I mean, you'd have, to, you'd have to look at each individual project. You know, these, these, these multi-well pads, uh, horizontal in, in, in the PRB, yeah, they're, they're, they're large. We're talking about, you know, 12 to $15 million in terms of, uh, of the cost of constructing them, but not all of that is subject to sales right. and use tax is the thing. And, and so I don't know, does the project contemplate every action uh, associated with the pad for its life? Um, maybe it does. I don't think it does. Uh, if it's just the construction part and you had enough wells on, on a pad or, or the project was big enough, you could get there. Uh, you know, I, I, it's just, it's not going to be, it's not going to capture as many as yeah. we initially thought is all sure. in Senator Senator office. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cooper, you have a question. Uh, just a, a, a comment on that. I think on a, on a pad situation, you know, if we got a four well pad or a six well pad, eight well pad, whatever it may be, we can get to that cost fairly easily. Some of these wells on an individual basis are, are going to be um, six to eight million dollars per well. But again, not all of that, uh, like Mr. Obermiller just stated, will be taxable. So <clears throat> over the, if you, we'd have to really get a definition of what a project is on the drilling completion side and then put a cutoff at some point into that project of, of what is drilling completion construction of the well and the well pad and what is is ongoing production um, there's got to be a there's got to be a segregation of that as far as where the tax would come the only really logistical way to collect it is, is what you just talked about where we collect all the tax and then and then credit back i, I think that could be a, a great benefit to uh, a lot of these operators to be able to amortize this um, but again, you're talking about the bigger projects, the uh, a pipeline or a, uh, um, a processing facility, maybe a big water injection facility where you're going to get enough into one, um, one facility or one project to, to justify this. Because even on a pad, those wells are all broke out by, um, with their own AFE, if you will. And, and tracked as such as individual wells uh, for the life of the well, uh, not just for drilling and completion, but through production. So uh, it's a great idea. I'm just not sure it's ready. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cooper. Mr. Obermuller, going, adding on to that, you know, I, I can see this being very useful in the big pipelines uh, where you, and things of that nature. But as he mentioned, where you've got different AFEs for different wells, this could get complicated very quickly. Do you see a lot of your members taking advantage of this? Obviously, this is a may, not a shall. Uh, this is an optional program. Uh, what do your What do you think your membership would think about doing this and the more complex uh, well pads and, and plans of development for oil and gas? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that, and um, I guess honestly, Mr. Chairman, just just from from a philosophical standpoint, really a carryover from when I used to work for the counties is I, I just I just love having options for my members to look at and decide in their professional opinion whether it works for them. Um, so if uh, so, uh, you know that I, I'm just I guess just generally I'm more eager to provide those options and and, and then let them figure it out rather than speculate how many could. There are some who would think it was just too much of a hassle. And there are some, like Senator Rothfuss has said, who will look at it, run the numbers, and say it's worth putting time into it to to make it happen. The time value of money and the uh, uh, the ability to push off that those payments for for time could make a difference in terms of some capital investments. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, but each one of them will make that 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 
determination themselves. And I just, I, I see it as part of my role to try to give for them as many options as possible. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rothfuss. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. One thing, Mr. Chairman, you'll recall, we, we struggle a little bit with what that number should start at. $5 million is where we're at right now. That's not a magic number. That's just where we ended up trying to, trying to account for the fact that it's a new program. We didn't want to overwhelm the Department of Revenue with a tremendous number of, <laughs> of applications right away before they knew what they were doing. And uh, I, maybe, maybe as we learn a little bit more, if we move forward with this and, and understand and we see, does oil and gas take advantage of this? Is this in their wheelhouse or is this falling short? And, and if it's falling short, uh, you know, we're, we're usually pretty good about coming back and, and uh, adjusting things to make them better and make them work for more people, particularly once it's up and running and we see. Uh, and, and I think uh, Mr. Obermuller is exactly right that, that his members will crunch the numbers. They'll see if this works. They're good at that. If this works, we'll see applications for it. We'll see them taking advantage of it. And if we don't see applications for it and they're not taking advantage of it, then we probably revisit with them later and say, hey, you know, when you crunch those numbers, how short did you come up? Does this need to be $2 million or, or what? Or does it matter that we get the entire uh, 6% if that's what it is in the county? It, you know, if we, if we get the entire uh, sales and use tax involved, the, did that then make the difference or, or what, the, what the key might be? This would be new territory for us, and I, I think it does get to the objective that Mr. Obermuller was saying, which is trying to reduce the upfront uh, cost and the, the upfront risk, recognizing that that's the hardest part of the financing. So if, if we can offload to, to cash flow, if we can take it from upfront and put it on cash flow, I think we're always helping industry. Absolutely. Uh, Senator Cooper. One thing I think that it might be helpful on it is if we can, we need to define on an oil and gas side, the scope of a project. If a project is a, is a one or two well um, drilling program, then it's not going to be terribly useful. But if we get some of our bigger operators um, where they've got a 30 well program or, or hopefully a 50 well program over a course of two years, uh, then you're talking about a, a very substantial sum of money and it, it, I can see it would be extremely beneficial to them and, and help them um, cash flow this project uh, up front a little bit easier. So I think it has some real potential for the bigger oil and gas projects. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Senator Rothfuss. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And to address Senator Cooper's point, the, the language is intentionally vague for that purpose. Uh, we, this isn't just about oil and gas, but it's definitely trying to, to address oil and gas. It's also trying to address wind, solar, pipeline. I mean, there's so many different things. So the only thing we get at is it would be a two-year timeline. So you've got two years to do whatever it is and, and for these expenditures, if you can kind of create your concept of a project in, in two years. And then you'll see on page three beginning on line nine, a very broad, as used in this paragraph, project means any land building or other improvement in all real and personal property, including machinery and equipment that results in an increase to the assessed valuation of the county or counties in which the project will be located that creates employment opportunities within the state or that otherwise adds economic value to goods, services, or resources within the state. And remember, when we started out, it was a little bit narrower and, and, and wasn't that great big broad scope. So the, the intent when we discussed it was really to just kind of let the concept of a project vary depending on, on the industry or the purpose or whatever else. But it, it goes into the idea that you can go in and negotiate with the Department of Revenue. If you have... Uh, you know, we've, we've got a couple of vast projects, if you want to call it that, coming online in the state. Maybe they get divided into a few chunks. Uh, maybe, maybe a few of our larger uh, drilling operations become four projects uh, just by scoping it out in discussion with the department. Um, statutorily, I don't think we should care. And, and I'd be interested if anyone else does. Statutorily, 
I, I, I think having a cohesive unit of this is what we're going to include in our scope that can be brought to the department so that you have something to talk about and then you're agreeing to terms on whatever it is that you're, you're looking at really is probably sufficient as long as it meets all of these other standards because I, I don't want to, through the definition, end up limiting unanticipated projects because we were we were being specific when i you know we, we we just don't know what the next great thing is going to be and i want it to be more conceptual of if i can if i can draw a picture of this is what i think my project is and it you know it it might be a might be a large pad operation with 16 wells on it and i'm going to call that my my project and i'm going to get those wells drilled and completed in two years and I can show you the timeline and we have a conversation with the department we, de we declare that a project so that I think that's the end the intent certainly of the language great thank you senator uh Pete do you have anything else to add or is that about finish you up okay thank you sir uh, appreciate all your efforts and uh, we'll look forward to working with you on this bill as it moves through the through the process looks like um County commissioners are back and Jeremiah, you're on the hot seat again. Welcome Great. back. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I think uh, Senator Cooper has seen me uh, pretty much all day. So uh, uh, my comments will be brief. Uh, you know, as Senator Rothfuss uh, mentioned, some of my counties really are interested in this tool. I also have another group of counties uh, that are really concerned uh, about the financial implications, uh, particularly during this time uh, for revenues that might be coming in. Now, I know we could say, well, you don't get uh, anything of nothing, uh, and, and that's certainly true. But, but a, as a result, uh, you know, my commissioners could not come to uh, a, a position on this bill as a collective group. That said, um, and, and maybe Senator Rothfuss has, has solved this for us because I had read this as if it did impact the local share of the state sales and use tax. Um, if, if that's not the case, uh, then there's no issue here. If it does impact that and or uh, the general purpose specific or economic development portions of sales and use tax, then there is a concern uh, that only the Department uh, of Revenue or the state for that matter really has the control over deciding all of these various factors. Um, and, and so if it does include in particular the uh, local portion of this, even if it includes the local portion of the state uh, sales and use tax, um, we would just ask for a what I think is a pretty simple amendment uh, to the bill. And that's on page two, uh, line 11. And, and we would just ask that after the word shall in, in line 11, we insert comma in consultation with the applicable county or counties comma, uh, so that there's at least a conversation uh, with those impacted entities uh, at the local level when you're developing out those amortization schedules, the fees, the terms, the conditions, et cetera, for a particular project. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd stand for questions, but appreciate the good work on this bill. Thank you, Jeremiah. Senator Rothfuss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jeremiah, so the last recommendation, though, is based on the assumption that it's, it's picking up the 1.2% and or more than that. Is that true? Mr. Chairman, Senator Rothfuss, that is correct. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, Jeremiah, if we're just dealing with the 2.8%, and I think we'll, we'll take, at least I'll encourage us to take an extra step and, and make sure that we're more explicit and we, we adopt some language recommended by Director Noble to, to help to clarify that, because I, I think there is some, um, at least some uncertainty in folks that have read it, uh, that, that that's what it's accomplishing, but, um, what I would ask you then, and it, my expectation was exactly what you said. Some counties will really want to do this and some counties won't want to do this. 
And, and my intent as I've developed this is to leave it up to the counties. Uh, once we get to that phase, this is not, this is not that bill. That would be the next bill. <laughs> is that something that you'd be, you'd be kind of interested in seeing then and working on is, is that next bill uh, with the rest of the 1.2? And then honestly, I've really struggled trying to think through. I've already been trying to think through what this bill would look like. I don't quite know how you deal with the, the fifth, sixth, and if there were one seventh cents appropriately, maybe there's a clean way to do that. But um, is that kind of the vision you would have if, if, if we passed this and it only applied to the 2.8, uh, maybe you'd see us working on a next bill to, to get all the rest as a local option? Mr. Reeman? Mr. Chairman, Senator Rothfuss, uh, if it only applies to the, the two point, uh, I think it's actually 2.76. Uh, so Something like that, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> a little, little more to ask. But uh, in any regard, if it only applies to that, we would ask that it be more explicit uh, in, in that regard. But, but if it only applies to that, we don't need any changes. Um, uh, to your second or your, your primary question there, yes, I think we would be interested in working on uh, that sort of a a tool. Um, many of my counties are uh, interested in this. Um, they just couldn't come to consensus on this bill. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, any further questions for Mr. Raymond and the county commissioners? No, nope, not seeing any. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank Stay you. tuned as we work this bill forward. Um, Mary Beth, do we have anybody else wishing to testify on this Mr. Chairman, we do not. Okay, Senate File 61, we will go ahead and close public comment. Uh, committee, what's your pleasure? Move the bill. Uh, moved by Rothfuss, seconded by, anybody? Uh, Senator Cooper will second that, okay. Any amendments? Senator Rothfuss, you, got, you wanna take a stab at one or? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, I, I'll ask that we do, and, and since we have another chamber, maybe we can be a little more flexible and circulate uh, the, the final amendment, but I'll ask that we amend conceptually to incorporate language drafted by Mr. Fuller in consultation with Director Noble to clearly and cleanly point to uh, the section 104 that he referenced to make it absolutely clear that we're talking about the state share only for this piece of legislation. Okay, anybody want to second that amendment? I'll go ahead and second that for you. Um, any discussion on the amendment to uh, fully uh, make sure that we're very clear that this is only regarding the state share of the sales tax, the conceptual amendment brought by Senator Rothfuss. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll call for the question. Uh, raise your hand. All those in favor of the amendment, raise your hand. Three, all, all those opposed. Um, okay, so that amendment has carried. Senator Rothfuss, do you have any others? Or Senator Cooper, Senator Wasserberger? Yep, Mr. Chairman, I have one more. Senator Rothfuss. Um, and we'll, this is on page two, line 13, after the word paragraph period, move to insert the language, interest rates shall be established to account for inflation over the term of the amortization. I'll repeat that. Interest rates shall be established to account for inflation over the term of the amortization. That makes it clear that we're targeting inflation rather than making revenue through penalties or something along those lines. Okay. That's my Chairman Veitman, this is Rihanna. Senator Raffas, can I have you repeat that just one more time? Absolutely. Interest rates shall be established to account for inflation over the term of the amortization. 
um, what line are we at again? I, you said page two, line... Line 13. Line 13, okay. Was... It's a new sentence then after the period... Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second on this amendment? Seconded by Wasserberger. Um, any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Okay, that has passed unanimously. Um, anybody else have any amendments on that's all I had, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, Senator Cooper. I'm not sure how to go about this, but do we need to put language in there on the collection of the tax that we talked about where it's, it's, it's collected up front and credited back? Does that need to be a, in, included in an amendment? I would guess, and Senator Roth has helped me out here, but I would guess that that could be done in rules and regs. Uh, through the department. Uh, he's shaking his head yes. So why don't we just uh, go with that? And if they have an issue with that, uh, they can certainly bring it up when it gets to the House side, or we can amend it, on, amend it on the floor as we work this bill. So, okay. Um, no further amendments. Any discussion on the bill as amended? No discussion, I guess. Uh, Rihanna, will you please call the roll on Senate File 61? Chairman Beitman, members of the committee, you are voting on Senate File 61 as amended. Senator Cooper? Aye. Senator Raffis? Aye. Senator Wasserberger? No. Senator Anderson? Excused, I mean absent, sorry. Chairman Beitman? Aye. Chairman Beitman, Senate File 61 amended has passed the Senate Standing Minerals Committee. Okay, and I will voluntold Senator Rothfuss to lead that bill for us. Thank you, sir, and thank you for all your work on this bill. Um, with that committee, let's take a quick 10 minute break um, to do some things, <laughs> get back to business here, and we'll see you all in 10 minutes. Um, thank you very much. Don't forget to turn off your cameras.
Chris, do you want to walk us through this last bill, the South Estate Bank Charter conversions, or is somebody else going to do that for us? You're on mute. Yeah, I'll do that one. That's out of the Blockchain Task Force. Great. Thank select you. committee. I guess we're a select committee. Yeah, and um, we, I put all the rest of your blockchain stuff for the next meeting so we can yeah meet. and honestly two of them should be on the corporations committee oh. so i have to get them reassigned or something i don't even know how to do that we'll figure it okay. out uh <laughs> i just figured it'd be easier to get these easy ones out of the way today yeah and work on yep. those next time absolutely how have you been doing haven't seen uh, you in a while it's been slow around yeah. here yeah just hanging in there luckily the kids are keeping me busy with all Good. their hockey and sports and stuff like that how's how's everything going for you how's the fam oh good also everyone's doing great uh, same thing i'm you know looking forward to the world returning to normal <laughs> me too i'll suck at that uh. Somehow I'm supposed to teach a course this semester. I have to figure out when that happens. Are you guys all online now? Um, no. So strangely, we are. I, my, my class is a face to face, but face to face is only for like a month and a half. And then after spring break, we go back to all online. So we start all online and I've got like a month and a half that would be face to face and then all online. But then when I layer, when I layer the legislative session over the top of that, I don't know. I really don't know how I'm going to schedule it. So that was what I was working on before our meeting started was how do I do this? So the face to face is probably when we're in session in person in March. I, a lot of it is. Yep. That's yeah. right. So perfect timing. Exactly. Mary Beth, it looks like we're waiting on Senator Cooper and Senator Wasserberger. Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, that would be correct. All right, we have Senator Cooper. Welcome back. We'll give Jeff a few minutes or a few seconds here before we get started.
There he is. Welcome back. Okay, committee, we'll get back into business here. Our last item up for business today is Senate File 42, Out of State Bank Charter Conversions. And the great Senator Rothfuss is warmed up in the on deck circle, ready to go. Senator Rothfuss, take it away, sir. Explain this Thank lovely bill to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senate File 42 out of state state bank charter conversions. Uh, we actually started it over in the blockchain select committee, but uh, bills that deal with banking um, still come over to the minerals committee uh, for sponsorship to kind of be worked twice. And this was a request by the division of banking that relates to the fact that honestly we've we've got such good statutes and such good policy related to banking and trust law and everything else we've worked on through the minerals committee over the last decade uh, that we've got out of state state chartered banks that want to relocate to wyoming and become wyoming chartered banks and have their headquarters and operations here, have bricks and mortar here, continue their operations elsewhere, but basically operate as Wyoming state chartered banks instead of chartered banks in the states that they're currently chartered. And I believe there are three uh, different banks that have expressed interest to our division of banking. Well, that caught our division of banking by surprise. We don't have anything in statute that allows for that to happen. We have statute in place that allows for a nationally chartered bank to be rechartered as a state chartered bank in Wyoming. Uh, but we don't have a state to state transfer provision. So it didn't take much. It just took a tweak. And that's what this bill does is provide for that possibility and basically mirrors what would happen if it were a national to state. So we already have that process in place. It's established. If you've got a nationally chartered bank, it has to meet certain standards if they want to recharter as a Wyoming state chartered bank. And the division of banking just worked with LSO to draft this to ensure that the same process can take place for state to state. So you see on page two, beginning on line 14, uh, an extension of existing statute that provides for this opportunity for an out-of-state state bank that may convert into a state chartered bank if the commissioner finds it appropriate. And again, all of those standards for appropriateness are based on the same standards that you would have if you were a national to state. Uh, conforming language on line 23 on to the next page conforming language on page four excuse me on lines four and five and then just a reference to a definition of as used in this section out of state state bank means and then we already have that elsewhere in statute so just referencing that for what we're referring to uh, and then again bottom of page three, lines 18 and 19. This is conforming language that allows for the possibility of that out-of-state state chartered bank to uh, convert to a state bank. Um, and it says confirming the conversion of a national to a state bank. In this instance, we're just broadening the language so that it would allow uh, for a state-to-state -state charter. Uh, another reference definition, top of page four. And then standards of approval on page four lines 16 through 19 are again, just an extension of the federal conversion to a state to state conversion, mirroring the same language and conforming language on page five. Uh, this is one that we might end up wanting to move up the time frame. We don't need to do that right now. In our last discussion with the division of banking, they were of the belief that this July 1st would not hold back any of the contemplated applicants. Uh, but as we move closer to the finish line, I think it's appropriate for us to check back in with Division of Banking and see if we're screwing anything up by having a July 1 or if we need to move that forward a little bit. And that's the bill, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rothfuss. That's pretty straightforward explanation to a pretty straightforward bill. Let's hear from Mr. Forkner. 
with the Division of Banking, if Mr. Forkner is on, here he comes. There you are. Hello, gentlemen. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Albert Forkner, the Banking Commissioner here with the Division of Banking. With me is Deputy Commissioner Jeremiah Bishop oversees our, our uh, depository side and trust companies. Uh, Senator Rothfuss did obviously a great job uh, on, uh, as, as your former colleague would say, a good little bill. And so I've, I've learned to adopt that language uh, from Senator Coe. Um, Senator Cooper, it's nice to, to meet you, at least virtually. Uh, unfortunately, we're not doing it in person, but hopefully that time will come here uh, before we know it. Uh, like, like Senator Rothfuss said earlier, we're all ready to, <laughs> to move ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, just a brief background, really, uh, maybe for uh, Senator Cooper, because uh, everyone else heard this as we talked about it in, in the interim, is, is this here, uh, Wyoming continues to take the lead in, in a number of areas, obviously the digital asset aspect, we all know about that and what our charter's done and how it's gained us, you know, international um, uh, acknowledgement. Our trust uh, companies are, are growing considerably to a tune of about three new companies a, uh, a year. And there's, we talked this morning about the house side, we've got a, a trust company bill. And as the center said, uh, we, over the last year or so, a couple of years, we've actually had um, some out of state, state charter banks that want to rain, retain that state charter. They don't, they don't have aspirations to be federally chartered, but don't necessarily like the jurisdiction that they're in for various reasons. Uh, you know, in, in Wyoming, uh, we've been, been, I think, very deliberate on how we regulate banks and, and very, uh, hopefully very balanced. And as long as I'm in, in this seat, uh, our regulatory approach is going to be measured and it's going to be tailored to the uh, risk that's posed to the state of Wyoming and Wyoming's consumers. And that's our main focus. Uh, and I don't think our institutions should bear the burden of the sins of the largest banks in this country. And so we're doing our best to make sure that uh, we, we tailor it and it's right size and, and the responsibility is spread to both the institutions and the consumers. And the legislature has, has been very agreeable and helpful in that and making sure that we've got uh, clear, clear statutes for them. And, and so I say all those things to, to that is what's attracting the attention in these various sectors to Wyoming. And, 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 and on the banking side, it, there, there's a couple of factors. And obviously, we, we've got a, a very business friendly environment in Wyoming. And, you know, banks are businesses uh, just like other institutions or organizations. Uh, and so they look for business friendly uh, environments. Now, banking law, because you've got a, a state and federal partnership, if you will, it kind of complicates that to some extent. But, but there's still opportunities to domicile in, in you know, uh, states that, that can appreciate that uh, regulatory approach and, and legislative approach. So those are the conversations that we've had over this last year with these groups. Um, and, and as the Senator said, they're, they're looking to, uh, now none of them have, have committed, although one's, one's starting uh, actually kind of down the path uh, more than we thought that they might at this point, but they're, they're wanting to, uh, they want some regulatory certainty and they want uh, the environment that we, we provide. And, and I think that we wanted to make sure that the avenue was there. Uh, uh, like, like the Senator said, it just never really had contemplated before because it hadn't been approached. Uh, we've converted a number of national banks to state charter in Wyoming. And, and that's really kind of a trend across the country. 80% 80, 80 of all the banks in this country have a state charter. And so that's why it's important to these other organizations to maintain a state relationship closer to their, your regulator than at the federal level. So um, this is what we think gives them an opportunity to do that. The, yes, they do have to be here. That's not just incorporating here, right, and keeping where they're at. Whether they keep existing facilities as branches, you know, that, that'll be a business decision, uh, whether they do or not. Um, but, uh, yeah, they'll be here. They'll be a, a community bank, you know, in, in whatever communities they decide in Wyoming and provide all the benefits that community banks provide to, to the citizens of the state. So I think this is uh, hopefully accomplishes that in, in, uh, in a, in a non-complex way. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I can sure stand for any additional questions you might have. Thank you, Commissioner Forkner. Um, anybody have any questions at this point? Uh, Mr. Forkner, do, 
obviously this is a good problem to have. Uh, we're having this, this discussion because we're doing something right and people want to come here. Uh, is there any uh, unintended consequences that may um, present themselves uh, from doing this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, that's a, that's a good question. Not that I can see, uh, you know, obviously there, there would be a potential for a, a new banking uh, organization to come into a community, but really that can be done today through de novo branching. So really any of these institutions, they could plop a branch down in any, any location in the state of Wyoming, uh, a national bank without objection, uh, and, and even really a state bank because of post Dodd Frank, or the, you can't discriminate against an out-of-state state bank. They're subject to the same restrictions or requirements of an in-state. And so, de novo branching allows you know uh, institutions to cross borders. So there is that. Uh, although as, as a regulator, uh, you know our job is to make sure that economic development opportunities continue to exist and in, in providing banking facilities and credit opportunities to our citizenry is, is one of our, our missions and our primary goals. And really that's what separates us, our charter from a national charter. They just don't have to contemplate that um, consideration to the level that we do. And so that, you know, what is that an unintended consequence? You know, I guess only if you're anti-competition, <laughs> you know, I understand that banking is a very competitive market and, and it changes every day. But uh, other than that, you know, they're, they're subject to the same supervision. In fact, I would argue that they're actually maybe held to a, a higher standard in the sense that they're then now subject to our supervision, just like the other banks in our state are, as opposed to if they're just a branch, uh, we're just simply a host state. And, and while we have nationwide agreements, they're just not the same level of, of supervisory expectations that we hold our, our in-state in banks to. Okay, thank you. Any, any further questions for Mr. Forkner? Uh, you're off the hook easy, sir. We'll see Mr. You Chairman, yeah, this could very well be a record on, uh, you know, I was going to tell Senator Cooper that, you know, at the end, if, our, if our bills are at the end of the day, you know, the committee knows that we tend to clear a room pretty easily. I think we probably did that online as well. I don't think we're <laughs> going to go viral or be trending, but uh, we also, you know, this could very well be a record on getting through, <laughs> through it. So I appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman. Hey, you're welcome. You're welcome anytime, sir. And, and you know, if you Everybody loves a good dry banking bill once in a while on the minerals. <laughs> okay, uh, seeing some comments here. Looks like Scott Meyer is in the waiting room. Mary Beth, you want to let Scott in to testify? Let's see. There, I see him now. Mr. Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Scott Meyer with the Wyoming Bankers Association. Uh, I will tell you that uh, we did have a lot of discussions with the, the, the Division of Banking about this bill. Uh, we not only support it, but we think that uh, the, the Banking Commissioner was, had great foresight into looking at some of this stuff. And uh, we always are looking forward to, uh, to having more banks uh, in Wyoming. And this, I think, does a lot to get us where we would like to be. It does uh, make Wyoming the place that people want to be. And I... Uh, Wanted to let you know that uh, we support wholeheartedly the, this bill. Excellent. Uh, anybody have any questions for Mr. Meyer? Any questions? No. Well, thank you, Mr. Meyer, for your testimony, and uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mary Beth, is there anybody else that would wish to testify uh, for this bill? Mr. Chairman, there is not. Okie doke. Well, with that, we will close public comment and committee, what is your pleasure? I move the bill, do pass. Moved by Rothfuss, seconded by Senator Wasserberger. Committee, are there any amendments? Any amendments? Any discussion on the bill? Good little bill. I miss Senator Coe. I miss the Boco show. I miss Why Senator Coe too. It's a good little bill. All right. Brianna, would you do the honors and call the roll, please? Yes. Chairman Bightman, members of the committee, you are voting on Senate File 42. Senator Cooper? Aye. Senator Raffis? Aye. Senator Wasterberger? Aye. Senator Anderson? Absent. Chairman Bightman? Aye. 
Uh, Chairman Beitman, Senate File 42 has passed the Senate Standing uh, Committee. All right. Well, committee, we whipped through those bills in record time. I should have put more on the list, but I got a little cold feet worrying that we were going to get too busy and run out of time. So with that, we have cleared the desk. Um, committee, is there any comments? No, nope, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Order. Appreciate okay. it. Well, I appreciate everybody's work. Thank you so much to Mary Beth and Rihanna for their help today. And thank you to everybody that testified and participated in today's meeting. And with that, I guess, shall we adjourn? Let's do it. Let's adjourn. Okay. We are adjourned at 348 p.